welcome to the next Houdini Kitchen. The subject of this tutorial is L systems and I have to admit that this has by far been the most difficult video to research, partly because L systems themselves are just an enormous topic which exists outside Houdini. In fact it's only one node in Houdini, um, but there's a, a lot of information out there uh, to learn about. Uh, and partly because L-Systems uh, often consist of long strings of notation and I don't think video is the best way for you to take that and integrate it with your own projects. A lot of the time you'd want to start with an existing L-System and adapt it. Uh, so before making this video I've created a, a document that will contain everything that's in this video and that way you can go and copy and paste things if you want. Um, or you can just go and study it a bit more carefully. So I'll put a link to the documentation alongside the video and I'll also put a link to a file containing examples of all the L systems in the video if you're too lazy even to copy and paste. So let's open up a new Houdini and get started. Um, first of all I'll give you a really brief overview of the L system node. Um, I'll stick in the geometry node and open up and if you type ls it's the only option in there so it's a nice easy shortcut and here's our L system node. Um, you can see when I put it down uh, it's giving me a little tree so this is our default L system. Um, I've used this for quite a few of the examples because um, it's a nice simple thing to get started on. Um, in fact the uh, L system, if you open up the settings here, you'll see there's actually a, quite a long list of presets. Uh, so if you want to take a look at some of the ways L systems are set up, you can load up some of these presets. And if you go into the rules, you can see the code that's generating them. These presets are largely taken from a book called The Algorithmic Beauty of Plants by Arsted Lindenmeyer and if you do a search for the algorithmic beauty of plants online you'll find uh, there's quite a few PDFs out there so the whole thing is available for you to read. Um, Arsted Lindenmeyer um, is the inventor of L systems, the L comes from the and Lindenmeyer in his name and he's uh, written a lot of information on them. If you look at the Houdini documentation for the L systems node, so I'll open that up as well, um, you will see in here that at the bottom of the documentation it recommends taking a look at his book if you want to learn a bit more about it. So it was under there under further reading. Um, so I've been through most of his book. Um, uh, there's an awful lot in there and um, it generally seems to be reproducible in Houdini but it's not entirely straightforward. So Houdini have taken his notation, uh, or rather side effects have taken his notation and built it into this node. Um, but they've also put in some shortcuts and some ways of um, making things more simple for you. So uh, some of this stuff it can be adapted to be a lot simpler and uh, they've also added some things that make it a bit more Houdini like for example being able to build polygons from our lines. Um, so part of the uh, intention behind the documentation that I wrote for this is to take some of the um, information in the algorithmic beauty of plants um, and make it a bit simpler for you to use so you can copy and paste it and you can understand exactly what's going on at any given point. So now I'm going to, let's revert this to factory defaults, so we go back to our uh, tree shape and take a quick look at the menus here. So, uh, actually let's start with a new one. Uh, so I'll go through these backwards because I probably tend to use them in that the amount that I'd use each menu is in reverse order. 
So the rules here are the most important bit of your L systems. This is where you write the code that creates the L systems. Um, and uh, most of the time you'll stay on the first page, but these pages are simply just further spaces to stick your rules. Um, then we have the functions, uh, which is uh, mostly consisting of setting up variables. We, To be honest, I've never touched these, um, and there's enough to worry about in the L systems, so we're going to ignore this menu. Uh, values are very important, so the rules contain uh, references to the values, and um, a lot of them are in there by default. So the, the step size, if we change that, is actually the size of each of these lines. Stick this back to 0.1, this is the default. Um, in my documentation, anywhere that I have changed a value, I give the change value. Anywhere that I don't give a value, it's using these defaults. Um, there's also some variables which you can use to write into your notation in the rules. Uh, the tubes uh, allow you to create polygons. At the moment, we're just creating lines. So if we go to geometry, we change this to tube you'll see that we're now creating polygons and these are your settings uh, for your polygons and you can also influence them from inside your rules and then the geometry menu uh, the thing that you'll come to most often in here is your generations and the generations reflect how many times the rules are run so uh, in this case every generation creates three more branches at the end of each branch so if we turn the skeleton off to speed things up a bit, make this a bit bigger, it tends to increase exponentially, so it can get quite slow when you have a lot of generations. Um, you'll see later, some L systems have huge numbers of generation, so up in the hundreds. Uh, some L systems break once you get about, above about seven generations. Uh, let's put this back to seven, which is the default, which usually runs OK. Um, and then we have uh, some randomization as well. Um, you can introduce randomization into your rules, um, which helps to houdinify everything. Uh, so you can create lots of variations on things. So when you're making L systems, you probably find most of the time that they're either used for plants, because they're very good for growth, or for fractal type patterns. Um, fractal type patterns have a pretty limited application in uh, video games, unless you're doing a very specific kind of game. So most of the time you'll be using these for plants. Uh, so I'm going to take you through some of the basics of the notation and um, hopefully at the end of it you'll be able to look at this string and understand what it's doing. Um, we'll start with something very simple though. So now let's start playing about with some of the rules. Um, if we look at our first rules file, so first of all we have a link to a text file. So if you wanted to write your rules externally, which might be useful if, you, if you're writing something really complicated, um, you can link to that here um, and tick this box to read from the file. But we're going to be writing all our rules within Houdini. Context ignore. Um, uh, if you're moving plus and minus, moving left and right, so obviously you'd want to ignore that. Again, we're not going to be touching this. Um, you can leave that as it is. Uh, the context includes symbols because we'll come to later. So the, the things you'll mostly be working with here are your premise and then your rules. And the premise is the initial setup, and then the rules are ways of manipulating that setup. For now, we're just going to work with the initial setup, so we'll delete these. And I'm going to turn on points because it makes it a little bit easier to see what's going on. So the L systems language is based on Turtle, um, which is a way of drawing lines through space. If you're a 3D artist, you probably find this quite hard to get your head around. No, I did. Um, because everything is relative to the turtle's last move. Um, which means that if you're moving around and rotating in different directions, you need to be aware of the way you are at all times. Um, unlike the way you would normally work in 3D, where you're always working within a set world space, um, and a certain direction or rotation will always take you the same way. Uh, let's get rid of this. So the basic uh, 
notation is extremely simple. We have an F, which takes you forward. So that simply draws a line forward. We have a small f, which takes you forward, uh, but doesn't draw anything. So if we now stick another f on the end, you'll see uh, we've got a gap there, because the small f didn't draw anything. We have an h, which takes you forward half a step, and a small h will go forward half a step and then not draw anything. So let's go back to an f again. And uh, there's also something I've never used, but there's a, a G, which moves you forward but doesn't draw a point at the end. So if we now stick another F on the end there, you'll see we've got one that's twice as long, because that actually consists of a G with no point, and then an F. Um, so you could use that to draw longer lines. And each of these lines is, by default, affected by the step size. So if we make this bigger, you see the lines get bigger. It's quite hard to make it smaller, but if we do, the lines get smaller. Um, and then we have uh, some variables that, some letters that will change direction. Um, so we have a, let's get rid of all of this lot. We have a plus symbol, which turns the turtle to the right. So imagine an actual turtle swimming uh, through space. So now the turtle's moved forward one, and then he's turned right, but he hasn't drawn anything. Uh, so we need to draw it again, and then you can see. Go from this direction, now you can see that he is turned to the right along the x-axis. And then if we put in a minus, that turns us to the left, and another f. So now we're going back to the left again. Um, The other rotations you can do for the turtle are you can rotate him about his axis and you can do this with a forward slash or a backslash. So if we do forward slash F, this shouldn't actually do anything because all we've done is rotated it around his axis. So you can't actually see what's happening here. But if we stick a plus symbol in there, you'll see now that we're not quite going, we're no longer sitting in the um, the xy plane. We've now rotated out to slightly in the z direction. And if you do a backslash, it will do the opposite. And the final notation we use for rotating is uh, the ampersand will tilt us up and down, which is actually giving us a very similar result with this point. As I said, it can be really hard to figure out exactly what's going on. Let's simplify this a lot more. So now you can see, instead of turning to the right, we're simply going in the z direction. And the opposite of the ampersand there's a little hat symbol. Yes, that's right. So, uh, obviously, you don't have to remember all these rules. Um, if you open up the help documentation, you'll see there's a list of all the commands here. The documentation gives the counterclockwise rule as a, sing as a double backspace, but in fact it seems to work for me as a single backspace. Um, so single backspace will turn you slightly, and double will turn you slightly more or less. Um, a single is the equivalent of a forward. So it may be that the documentation is slightly out of date on that. Um, the rotation commands 
um, let's just do some pluses and minuses because it's a lot simpler to see what's going on in 2D. So uh, the rotation is directly linked to the value for angle. So in the same way as we can change the step size here, we can change the angle. Um, so if you're wanting steps, you can just set your angle at 90 degrees. Um, it's not terribly helpful that it applies to all angles. Uh, so um, if we now uh, turn into the Z direction, you can see it's also at 90 degrees. But uh, I'll show you later on how you can actually change these angles individually for each. So this is the basic premise for your notation for drawing lines. Uh, the second thing that you will um, use very often in your else instance, which allows you to create plants, is branching. And branching uses a square bracket. So the way branching works is if you stick anything inside your notation in square brackets, when you close the brackets, it jumps back to before the brackets again. So each of those becomes an individual branch. So let's say we go, turn off to the right here and go forward, right again, forward and then close the branch. So we now have, this is all contained within our square brackets. So outside of that, our branches just continue from where we left off. So you can do quite a long, complex train of branches. Let's go the other way. And then go back to our main branch and we could go the other way direction with this one. So we go plus F. Uh, so this line here is our main stem and then these two are branches off it. Um, let's go up to the right again. Uh, something you need to be aware of is if you put your turn outside your branch Kind of branch. Uh, and then go straight back into your main branch again. Um, because the turn is outside the branch, then it's being picked up here as well. So you've actually got two lines drawn on top of each other. So probably we wanted that. Um, so we've got uh, some not very exciting lines here. You could if you want to create a tree out of that, but it would be incredibly complicated and long and laborious. Um, so what we want to do is start working with rules. So the, the way that the rules work is we set up an initial premise. Uh, I'm going to take this right back to just being a single forward line. And then our rules take part of the premise, and in this case there's only one part, use an equal sign to assign a new value to it. Um, and then for every generation, each of the parts in the premise is replaced by the rule. So we have F equals. Uh, so for this one, if I remember correctly, it's F plus F minus minus F plus F. And I think that's worked, but it's hard to tell because of our 90 degree angle. So I'm going to change this to 60. There we go. So what we've done here is we've split it on one generation as well. Uh, so zero generations just gives you your premise. That's our line. One generation takes that line and it replaces it with a line that goes forward, 
right, left, forward again, and right, and then forward again. So instead of a single line, we have the shape. Uh, and then because our premise now consists of a list of more Fs, the next time we run that rule, it takes each of these Fs and replaces it again with that same line. So if we add a generation, you can see we now have, if we look at this on a larger scale, this is our shape, but inside each of the lines, we've repeated that shape again. So we're building up a kind of fractal here. So let's add three generations. And you can see we've still got the same basic shape, but it's getting a lot more complicated. Four generations, again, same shape, but uh, because we've got so much detail in there, it's starting to look smoother. Uh, the reason that it grows with each generation is that the uh, each of these Fs is the same length, so we're replacing uh, a single value with four new Fs. So we're going to end up with something a lot bigger in the replacement. It is. I'll show you how to do this later on, but it is possible to build it so that it stays within the, um, the same scale, so it sits within the, the size of the line at the start. Uh, let's try another example. Um, I have a crib sheet because these start getting quite hard to remember. So for this one, I've got a kind of diamond shape I'm going to replace it with. If we go back to our generations and stick it on zero, I've got a single line again. And then go for one generation. Now, I'd like to note is that Houdini um, actually has um, a float for generations. Um, so it's possible to have a fraction of a generation. And what it does is it iterates between the two. But the results you get are a bit confusing. Uh, it's generally easier, certainly when you're learning to stick to full generations. Uh, so what we've got here is a line that goes up and does a loop. And then if we stick another generation in, it replaces each of these lines with the same thing again. You see they touch at the corner. If we go in and play with the angle, uh, you'll see they're actually separate. Works best with a 60 degree angle. And again, we're getting a kind of fractal shape. Uh, six generations, it's really complicated. So, uh, this gets exponentially bigger. You can see you can very quickly build up extremely complicated shapes using this. Though, as I said, the use of uh, geometric fractal shapes in games is probably quite limited. And we're really more interested in uh, L systems for their ability to build plants. If you take a look at the documentation, it's quite near the start. There's a collection of shapes here, um, which uh, I have links to in the documentation as well with the, the notations. But you can see the notations here are pretty straightforward. Um, these give you some interesting geometric shapes if that's something you'd like to play around with. So this concept that we've just looked at is called edge rewriting. So you're, you're taking a line, in this case the F, and replacing it with a new sequence. Uh, what you probably use more often is something called node rewriting, um, which introduces a new concept. Uh, let's get rid of this. Um, go back to our original line. Internal points back on again. Um, and now we're going to use, introduce uh, the concept of a node. In this case, we're going to call it A. So A doesn't actually do anything. Um, we're just putting a letter into our premise, and then we can reference that letter in the rules. Um, you can, in theory, use any 
value for your letter. Um, in practice, uh, ABC I use quite a lot, X. So you're looking at things that are um, not being used for anything else. So, well, in this case, we'll use A. So now we want, uh, let me go back to my crib sheet. We want to use this for a rule. So for every A, uh, I'll actually type on it. So every A, we create H, remember, is a half line. Um, so we go right, then a half line, left, left, half line, and then right again. So right, H, left, left, H, right. And this is done a little angle at the end. We have to do the, the double minus, because if we just did a single one, it would take us into a straight line up here. But we want to come back to the same point. Um, all this is doing is drawing a single zigzag, because there's no A within our rule. So once it's done this, no matter how many generations you create, it's always just going to draw one line. Uh, so we also want to stick an A on the end. And then in the for every generation, it will draw this shape. And then we've got a new A here. Our first one's been replaced, so that's gone. There's a new one here. And then in the next generation, it'll draw another zigzag. So now we've got a zigzag for every generation. Um, this is really straightforward. Um, generally, you do something a bit more interesting. Um, but it's a good way, I think, of showing how it works. Now, if we had another A in our premise, so if we stick one at the start, we start drawing them in both directions at the same time. So it's replacing each A on our line with a zigzag. Let's try another premise. So if I go back. Again, really simple. So what we're doing here is we're going, replacing our A, first of all with an A. So for every generation, the A starts at the same point again. And then minus is an angle, so it takes it uh, left by a certain number of degrees, and then it creates a branch. It's getting a little bit closer to the way we might use L systems to create um, natural shapes. Um, it's a bit easier to see if we reduce the angle. So now you can see, uh, for every generation, it's drawing a branch and then rotating a little bit. And because the rotation is outside the branch, then that accumulates, so it goes a little bit further each time. And if we ramp up our generations, we start getting lots of lines. So knowing all this, it should be possible to understand what's going on on the default L system. Let's take a look at this. Uh, I'm going to delete some stuff, which you don't actually need to know at this point. Uh, so first of all, we have our initial premise. We go back to zero generations, we're just drawing our premise. So it's going forward, 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 and then inserting a node A, which isn't doing anything. And then every time there's a node A, it's replacing that with three Bs. So now we're starting to nest um, nodes within nodes. So each A is replaced with a branch, and then it rotates, and another branch, and then it rotates, and then there's a final B, which isn't part of a branch. So that actually moves everything along. So if we do one generation, we've actually performed this, but it still hasn't done anything, because there's, no, there's nothing drawing in as part of this. There's no Fs in there. We need another generation which moves us on to our second rule, which takes every B and replaces it with uh, this movement forward um, and it sticks a new A on the end. So at the end of each of these branches, go to the second generation, 
we now have another A. So by the third generation, we're starting to draw on these points instead of here. Um, you could also make this a bit simpler by replacing bits of the Bs within this rule. And now uh, it doesn't need two generations to get there. It'll do that in the first generation. Um, so that's just a simpler way of drawing the same thing. Uh, so if we ramp up our generations, we'll see for each generation it generates another three branches. Once again, if you take a look at the algorithmic beauty of plants, there are some really nice some really nice examples of branching plants. A lot of them look a bit like seaweed um, using um, node replacement. So in this case they're using the uh, variable x and replacing that and uh, my documentation will have links to the same plants with the, um, the notation that you would use in Houdini. Now, I said that I would show you a way of changing values individually. Let's go back to our original L system and we'll change this slightly. So instead of just rotating uh, in a single axis, we're going to uh, use a forward slash to roll and then uh, a minus so that we also turn and we'll make this an F so that everything is equal. And we'll need to stick another A on the end. Actually we'll stick an A at the beginning. There we go. So now if we look top down, it's not very easy to see, but if you look top down you will see that there is um, there are two different angles going on here. So we're rolling about the axis and then we're turning. And if we make our angles a bit more definite, let's make a 60. It's a bit clearer what's going on. Um, the trouble with this is as we increase our angle, the not only is the angle between uh, our initial stock um, and the degree that they turn away from it increasing, but the angle between the uh, each individual branch is increasing as well. And that's probably not what we want. Um, so if we make this angle 30 degrees uh, and then increase our geometry. So now we've got a full circle. But as soon as we want to change uh, our turn angle, then this breaks. So what we can do is we can put a number in brackets after our um, roll. So if we make this 30, then that fixes the roll angle at 30. And we can change the, um, the turn angle. So it's possible to override any of these values within your rules. Um, let's say we don't want uh, these lines to be as long. So if we take this F, we can make it 0 0.05. So the default in our values is, oh, our default stop step size is actually very small. It should be 0 0.1. Um, but we've made it half that. That's actually the same as using an H. But now we've got a lot more control over it. So we could make it twice as long. So all these variables can be overridden within your rules and this can actually give you quite a lot more control over the way things are drawn. Now if we take a look at the documentation um, it actually shows you a nice trick that you can do 
and for sure overriding the variables. So I can find it. I got control length over time. So what you can do here is set up a variable and then every time every generation when uh, a rule is run you can edit that variable so uh, let's copy this and then we'll set it up see how it works um, the important thing you need to know when you're doing this is you have to give it a value at the start otherwise it doesn't know what it's doing so we start off by giving it a value of one And then, um, this is really simple um, expression here. We're just simply taking an A and then every generation replacing it with FA. But we're taking that initial one. So in the first generation, the one is fed through to the I variable. And we're... Uh, using it to draw our line. So it, the first line starts off with a value of one. And then we draw A, but we give it a value of half of one. So in this generation, it is a value of 0 0.5. And then it's fed through again. So it starts off at 0 0.5. We draw a line at 0 0.5. And then we have it again. So it becomes 0 0.25. So the next line is even smaller. So for each generation, oops, each generation it stink it uh, shrinks uh, there is actually a shortcut to doing this um, which is built into Houdini and that's using our step size scale and it uses the inverted commas command it's quite handy um, if you forget uh, what notation you're supposed to be using here to substitute these values if you hover over them it will tell you so yeah, this will give you the default size uh, so, what you could do to simplify this a lot is remove our values here, and before our a, we'll stick in inverted commas. And now we're taking these two values. See, it looks quite different because these two values are different. So, if we want to make an exact copy, our step size on the previous one we set up was one, and our step size scale was 0 0.5. So every generation it was reducing it to 0 0.5. So you can see there that we're getting the same thing, um, except as we explained in the last example, um, now anything that we put within this um, rule is also going to take on the value of 0 0.5, which might not be what we want. Uh, so we don't have as much control over it. And in fact, um, this, uh, rule that we've set up here is extremely flexible and we can do a lot with it. Um, let's show you it in a slightly more complicated example, which I can written down here because it's quite hard to remember. Um, so actually what we'll do is we'll go back to the default because it's based on the default. And tweak it and make it a bit easier to understand. So uh, we have our forward, forward, forward A, and then the next rule. If we ignore everything in brackets for now, then uh, so you'll now recognise what this is doing in uh, the default L system. This is referring to step size scale. So you can see. Um, we can make it smaller with each generation using this. This is 0.9. Uh, we're going to take it out and override it. And everywhere that we've got B, we're going to simplify things a bit by putting it and FA. Just make it a bit smaller. And we're going to take out one of the branches because we're going to make this 2D. And 
down a little bit. We're actually going to make this a branch as well. I think the only difference is our angle. So like this 45. There we go. Uh, not very easy to see what's going on at this stage. So if we stick back our um, inverted commas, uh, now you can see it's behaving as we would expect. So we've still got a tree shape, but it's all in 2D now. So each split only makes two branches. And then we insert our value of 1, and then we reduce that by 0 0.5 for each generation. I'm not going to type all this out again. I'll just stick it in here. So now you can see we've got control over each generation. One last uh, use of uh, custom variables that I want to look at is using some of the variables in the values and inserting them into your rules. So we can take this 0 0.5 and place it with D. So now that's referencing our variable D and you can see uh, it's only affecting half the branches because on our second branch it's still using 0 0.5 so let's make it C so now we've got uh, control over each of these variables separately and you can use these variables anywhere in your functions um, it's quite useful if you're setting up something very complicated you can uh, you can use a variable several times across the function and uh, it gives you it makes it far easier to control and it gives you a lot more control over it. Uh, there are some examples in the algorithmic beauty of plants um, for modeling trees and these are known as monopodial trees and sympodial trees and in fact these are built into the defaults in Houdini. So create a new L system. And you see here we've got the monopodial tree. And in fact, these are set up in exactly this way. Uh, it looks very complicated. So we have uh, a list of variables which are referencing values. So if we change these values, you can play around with the way that the tree is grown. And then there's the Sympodial tree as well. And again, you can play around with these values. So, in the documentation, I have uh, these trees drawn out and an explanation of exactly what's going on here. So, you can start playing around with them yourself. One more variable to look at is gravity which if you hover over it is um, represented by the uh, variable t, which is for tropism. Um, so let's go back to our find it again, simpler example with our uh, 2D plant. And I'll simplify this a little bit. Start to about five. And uh, in order to affect gravity, either um, across the whole of a rule or within a branch, is just to stick the letter T into it. Um, by default, it's zero. So if we increase that, you'll see gravity starts pulling our branches down. And it works um, 
the amount of gravity you use is multiplied across each branch. So uh, every time a rule is run, it will increase the amount of gravity. And you can see, you can also put it in the negative direction, so everything's being pulled up. Um, you don't have a huge amount of control over gravity because it's um, always downwards in the y direction. Uh, the uh, algorithmic beauty of plants um, has a formula for writing in gravity, which somebody who's better at uh, 3D maths than me might be able to um, translate into the L systems. Um, but uh, I'm afraid within this system you're limited to the y direction. Um, if we take a look at the next tree, uh, is known as in uh, 3D in the algorithmic beauty of plants is known as a ternary tree and they use this to demonstrate gravity so let's load that one up uh, again we have a default setting for this I'm going to take the tubes off because it slows things down and then we can do a few more generations and go back to our rules. So now we can stick some gravity in here. Which is not working. Let me check. Ah, probably just because the gravity is not turned on. Right, let's go back. So you can see you're already getting a much more lifelike tree when you add some gravity to it. Um, if you take a look at the documentation that I made, um, I've shown how... Uh, so if you look at the algorithmic plant, you're getting this really nice sideways sweep as if the wind has been blowing the tree, um, which you can't do in Houdini, at least not directly. Uh, so uh, for this one, in order to create it, I grew the tree at an angle. Um, so that the downward direction is actually pointing in that direction um, and then rotated the tree upright again. So all these trees um, have the correct settings for Houdini in them. You can see this is how they're set up. Because they're set up using variables then they just have a single set of rules and the trees themselves just use variations on those rules. Now we're going to look at a way of making our AL system look like proper plants rather than just a collection of lines. Um, and we're going to do this by adding geometry into them. So <coughs> first of all, we create our default L system again. And take a look at our rules. And first of all, what we're going to do is put some leaves at each of the junctions. Now you'll see that there's a collection of inputs to your L systems. Now the first of three inputs that you've got here are to bring in geometry. Uh, the fourth input is something I'm not going to cover today. Um, it allows you to use uh, Houdini's metaballs to create shape that can um, limit the growth of an L system. So you can make a shape that the L system is confined within. Um, I think this would be really useful if it was something other than metaballs. Um, I find metaballs slightly clunky to work with. Um, but it's certainly something you could look at if you're wanting to uh, create gro growth within a set shape. So uh, what we're going to be looking at is uh, the first three inputs, which are our geometry inputs. And I'm going to drop down uh, file node and bring in a piece of geometry that I made earlier. Let's go for the narrow leaf. Uh, take a look at this. Let's see. Have a leaf here. And it's probably far too big, but we'll leave it for now. And I'm going to hook this up to the first leaf input, which is J. And nice and simply, as you would expect, this is created simply by adding the character J to our rules. So 
if we uh, let's stick it on the end first of all so uh, this if you remember um, the way the default L system uh, branching system works is we create three branches um, which are referred to as B and then each of those is replaced by a new branch uh, which repeats the whole thing and what I've done is just stuck a J on the end and as you'd expect on the end of each of the branches we have our um, leaf and the uh, value that comes in for our values is also inherited by the input geometry so although we started off with a huge leaf in fact it's been shrunk down and you'll see if we increase the step size it grows with it to one, not point one. Um, so it's not really what we want here so I'll get rid of that and uh, what I'm going to do is put in, uh, for each branch, I'm going to put in a leaf at a slightly offset angle. So I'm going to put another branch first, and we're going to um, rotate it first of all, and then put in our J, and then close the branch again, because we want to do that before we start drawing our B branch. So now we have a collection of leaves that sit at each of the junctions and we're going to do that three times so for each of the branches and so now we've got something that looks a bit more realistic and the second thing we're going to do is put in some berries uh, this time we just want them on the end of branches so as we did here we're going to stick them on the end and we're going to bring in a new file node and a uh, white flower in D. The, these um, pieces of geometry which I'll share with you are actually um, four different stages of flowering and the last one is a berry. You'll see that there's a little red berry and we put that into the second input which is K and then all we need to do is stick a K on the end. And now we're getting berries. Uh, what we're not getting is colour. So why is that not working? So if we middle mouse over this, you can see that our colour is a primitive attribute on this one. And it's a point attribute in this one. So uh, that explains why we're not getting. We need to do a attribute promote so that our colour values on both our inputs are the same. So if we go to our attribute promote, we want. Ah, didn't seem to be there. One primitive attribute colour. Why are we getting there? Ah, because we need to change our original class. So if we go from primitive we have colour to point. So now we have our colour and this one should be on point already. So uh, now you can see something that looks a bit more natural. I still don't think, well maybe we are getting the correct colours on our leaves. I know what's wrong with it. We also have a mismatch on normals. So if we stick a normal node on the end We're not getting any geometry on our branches at the moment, so let's go back to our L system and turn on tubes. And you can see that we are, well for a start everything's immediately turned grey, which isn't what we want, um, but we are getting tubes. And if we look at our tubes we probably could make them a little bit thinner. And the other thing we can do is scale down the thickness as it reaches the end. So that's just starting to look a bit 
more natural. If we want our colours back, um, the L system will overwrite the colour values on the points. So actually what we want to do is turn these around. So we want this one to go from points to primitives. Um, so now our colour values are being written to our primitives, which isn't being overridden by the L system. Uh, we might want our tubes coloured as well. So let's come out of here and add a colour node. And let's make this uh, green. It's a bit more natural, I think. Uh, right, something that's useful when you create an L system is it will take the geometry that you've brought into it and it will output it as a group. So if you take a look at our uh, primitive groups, you'll see we have L system J and L system K among the other groups. Uh, there are quite a lot of groups coming in there from the geometry already. So what we need to do here is find our L system J and then if we put an exclamation mark and part in front of that, it will do everything except for that. And the same with K. So now we're excluding those from our colour group. And the last thing we want to do is assign that to primitives. There we go. So now we're getting something that looks a little bit more like a real plant. Uh, I would say our geometry is probably a little bit small. So here we can go back and take some of our um, variables and apply them to the J and the K. So we know at the moment our step size value is 0.1. Uh, J is our leaves. Let's make this a little bit bigger, so make them 0.2. So you can see now we're overriding the size in our um, values, so probably a bit big, say 0.15. Oops. a bit bigger now and we want our batteries a bit bigger as well. Make them two. Oh, 0.2. Uh, what we could also do here is um, use our uh, rule that increases over each generation. So if we were to take um, so we want our J to be 0 0.15. If we were to take our A, 0 0.1, which is what it is anyway, and then give it a variable, then we could pull this variable in to each generation. So let's make it uh, I. And then every time we have B, we can multiply it by a value. And I'm going to make that B in, there's a small B in our values so that we can tweak it. Uh, see, we've already messed it up. So. And we want to feed this back to our A. And okay, it's a bit extreme.
we seem to be doing here is increasing the value for each generation. We want to be reducing it. Right, I'm going to take these off the B values because uh, it's already doing it here. Okay, looks like the problem we have is we need to feed. Uh, so we're doing our A uh, reduction in this step, so we need to feed the I through to this step as well. So we just need a single I at the end of each one. You can see that even quite simple uh, L systems can take a fair bit of figuring out. Now go to our B value. So, yeah, so now if it's below one, the leaves get smaller. If it's above one, the leaves get bigger with each generation. Um, we no longer have uh, control over the overall size. So let's go back. Uh, so the actual value of each of these, let's make it twice as big. So we'll make that 2i. So that's for the j's, which are the leaves. Uh, I need it. Multiply in there. Uh, some of the mathematics notation in L systems is pretty basic. Um, so it takes a bit of try and error to get things right. So let's go back to our values. Uh, there we go. So now we're getting progressively slightly smaller leaves on each generation. Uh, let's show you another example now. Um, I'll take one from the algorithmic beauty of plants, which is a little bit more natural. So drop another L system down. Um, and this time I'll copy and paste the code. So you take a look at the algorithmic beauty of plants. This is roughly what we're trying to get. Um, you can uh, see that it's taken a fair bit of translation of the algorithm here to get it working in Houdini. So, first of all, we'll put in two new pieces of, oops, of geometry from files. This time we want B stage of our flower. And we're gonna make it yellow. This should have come in with some groups. Yeah, there's a group here called red, which in fact is the central stamen. So I'm gonna do the inverse of that. And we want to put this again on our primitives. So there's a flower. And then we also, actually we'll just use this one. What else we want? Our leaf. So I'll make a copy of this. And those are our rules. Uh, the initial premise is just an A. The rules themselves are, in fact, very similar to the one that we've just looked at. Um, it's just that we have more of them and we have more letters. Uh, so we're getting a bit more variation in the shapes of the branches in this plant. Um, we have also in here, we have the J input and we have the K input. Nothing. Uh, the 
these last two values, this is the um, angle, it's quite small, it's only 18, and this is the number of generations. up our inputs and try to figure out why we're not seeing anything. Take a look. It's like we're missing the A equals, so we've got nothing actually assigned to. I think we've got this one way around. We want our leaves to be drawn along the stems and our flowers on the end. So you can see with just a few tweaks you start getting something quite natural. Let's put a cut and put flowers with the gutter for the leaves. Rather than um, assigning variable to each leaf individually, we can also do it this way. And we can use the same system as before. I'm not going to go through it again, but if we wanted to set up colour uh, and tubes on the stems, we could also create that. Let's stick our normals on the end here so that we've got those working correctly as well. And one more thing I want to show you in this plant is the tilde symbol, symbol which um, converts these rotation values to random values. So if we put this into our, um, our first rule which determines the branching, let's take a tilde at the start. Um, and this will affect everything further down the branch. Uh, first result is not what we want at all. That's because the randomization goes from 0 to 180. So we're getting all sorts of angles that we don't want. In fact, the angles that we were using here are 18, which is quite small. So let's instead... Uh, so we can add a variable to this. Um, which gives us our maximum angle. So if we add in 30, then we're always going to stay, all our angles will be at less than 30 degrees. Um, so we're getting a slightly different plant here. And now if we go back to our geometry, we can play around with the random seed. And you can see that uh, we're actually getting a bunch of different plants. So now you can see how L systems in Houdini um, might behave in the way that you would, uh, in a, a procedural way that you'd expect from Houdini. So you could set up one L system and uh, generate a whole bunch of plants from it. Um, the other thing uh, to look at is a random scale. So uh, this will randomize the values of the lines. Um, and again, it gives you a bunch of different plants. There's one last concept I want to look at in this video and that's stamping. Um, if you watch my earlier video on uh, copy stamping and the for each loop, you'll have heard me say that copy stamping is no longer recommended by Houdini. However, it is still very useful inside an L system. Um, it's quite simple to show you because it's always used in the same way. So if we uh, go into our documentation, there should be a link here to stamping variables. And uh, the formula we want is this one here. And what this allows us to do is to take a variable from inside our rules and use it to affect 
the geometry further up the system. Um, possibly the most basic use of this is if you want a plant that has more than three types of geometry in it. Um, so uh, say you wanted um, two different kinds of leaves, uh, flowers at three stages of opening and some berries. Um, this isn't uh, possible using just three inputs. So what you would do is attach a switch node to one of your inputs. And then in your select input, you would stick in this formula. And what this means is, so path to L system, we want this to be L system six. This gives us most of our L systems. Uh, the zero is just the default value that's used if it doesn't find anything in the variables. And what this L sys refers to is our, if we look at our functions, our leaf parameter A has this value. Um, now, when you create a, uh, a geometry node. Um, so we have the J and the K. If you look at the variables inside these geometry nodes, um, there's actually several variables that you can attach. So the first one is the scale. I'm going to take this off so that you can actually see what's going on. Um, so if we make that one, you'll see I should get yeah, some crazy big geometry. Uh, the second one is unused, so you can either make it zero or you can just stick in two commas so that there's a gap. And the third one actually refers to this variable which is being sent back up to our um, expression. So what it will do is for every one of these leaves it will look for the, uh, the third variable in our L system. Um, something that I think is probably a bug, which I've reported to side effects, is that side effects documentation does say that you can leave this one blank uh, to use the default, but that doesn't seem to work for me. So uh, at the moment, you do appear to need to put a value in there. So I'm going to stick this switch node in. So we're now on the third leaf input. So I'll make this M. And I'm just going to stick in two flowers. And the only difference between them would be the colour. And now in here, if we make this variable zero, we should get the first flower. And if we make it one, we should get the second flower. Yes, it worked. So um, we can now uh, set up a system where we have two different inputs. Um, so let's stick this in somewhere else. more flowers. Yep, there we have more flowers now. And oops, take the A out, we don't need that. And we'll make this one zero. So now we have an L system that has uh, four different geometry inputs. Actually it doesn't because we're not using this anymore, but you can understand the principle of how this would work. Um, the other thing you can do with your switch node is take values from here and use them to change uh, the upstream values. Uh, so let's make a new L system to demonstrate this. And I'm going to use my 
my cheat notes again. Uh, take another copy of this flower. And plug it in. And these are the rules. Generations twenty one. So you can see what I'm going here. Let's see. Step size scale. Yes, that needs to be changed as well. So we have uh, basically a collection of flowers here um, growing along the tube. Um, and what we want to do is change the value of their colour as they go up. So we're going to use our stamping for this. So we're putting this inside our colour values. So first of all our stamp here is to refer to our L system. In this case it's L system 7. And you can see already it's taking the values from our L system. And what this referring to here is our third uh, value in our rules, um, which is T. I'll explain that in a minute. Right, let's set up the other colours. Right. Seven. And that's one. value that we're getting out of here doesn't sit within 0 to 1. In fact we've got 21 generations so what we're doing is dividing that by 20 um, which will give us a value between 0 and 1. So you can see now the colour changes as uh, the flowers go up and that's being driven by this value here. Uh, the T is a new variable that I haven't introduced you to yet and the T refers to the number of iterations in your um, plant. Um, so it's basically the number of generations. Uh, the main difference between generations and T is that um, the iterations are higher for the earlier generations. So it decreases as you get towards the branches. Um, we're also using that T variable in our scale because as I explained to you um, the scale here overrides um, the scale in our values so um, we're having to reset that so if we just we, if we just had it at 0 0.5 then the flowers would be the same all the way up this way we're using the T value to um, also make changes to scale as the um, the generations increase. So you can see the stamping variable can be really flexible inside L systems. And again, it gives you a lot more control um, if, you're, if you're willing to sit down and figure it out uh, and write something really complicated, then there's a lot you can do with it. 
The last two concepts for L-system rules that I want to show you are probability and conditionals, um, which are related to each other. I'll show you probability first because it's really simple. Um, so I've gone back to our default L system um, where we added in our leaves and our berries. I'm going to increase the generations a bit, I think, uh, just so we've got a bit more there. Uh, you'll notice that because uh, there's two rules here, one which does the branching and one which adds um, on the next generation, uh, it kind of skips a generation. So if we do 10, uh, we just move on and we get our berries, and then 11, we'll get some more leaves. And um, what we want to do here is drop out some of our branches. So if we go into our rules, on the end of this, and the way that you set up probability is with a colon, and then you give it a value between uh, 0 and 1. Um, and it, uh, what it will do is it will run that branch, um, um, take, it'll convert that into a percentage, so multiply it by 100, and then that's the percentage of times that that branch will be created. So if we make this 75, Sorry, I did say between 0 and 1. So if we make this 0 0.75, um, so it only creates branches uh, every three out of four times that that rule is run. Uh, you can see you're actually looking at a lot less foliage. You're probably only looking about half as much foliage. And that's because when it drops out the earlier branches, it's no longer creating any of the, the later foliage. So in each generation, it's dropping out 75%. So we could change that to 0.5, and you'll get a lot less. Uh, so although, in theory, it's creating branches half the time, um, you're actually getting very few here, because uh, what actually happens is in the first generation, it dropped out um, two out of the three. So there wasn't much left to work with. So you probably mostly want a slightly higher value for this. Uh, again, this is affected by the random seed, so you can create lots of different variations on your plant. See there's one there where it actually dropped everything out in the first generation. Uh, what we could also do that with this is use it to create a uh, different rule. So if we stick another rule on here and instead of adding a k variable let's take our flower I'll stick it in M and let's change the colour. Actually, no, we don't need to change the colour because it's flowers and berries. What we need to do is change our original input. We'll change it to flower B, which is actually a flower. This one's a berry, this one's a flower. And on the end of this, we'll stick an M. So the first result of this should be that we have a flower at the end of every stalk. Uh, but we don't want always to have flowers and berries. What we want is to sometimes of one and sometimes of the other randomly. So let's make this 0.4. I'll make this a bit lower as well. So now we have a plant. It'll sometimes have a berry and a flower, but uh, sometimes it'll have one or the other. So again, we're introducing a bit more randomization using probability. And you can do this to any rule. Uh, you just stick this on the end. You get the probability of that rule evaluating. So we also have something called conditionals. And what this does is allows you to put a condition inside a rule that tells you whether it evaluates or not. Um, and there's a variety of uses for these. Uh, I'll uh, give you a demonstration of how they might work. So let's another L system. Uh, 
I'm going to refer to my cheat sheet again. So this one's actually really simple. So we create a node and we uh, have two different conditions that we use, or two different rules rather, that we use depending on conditions. So We're again looking at this t variable, which, if you remember, is the number of iterations, um, which will be uh, one for the last generation, um, uh, going up to the no total number of generations for the first generation. And I think the other value in there was angle, 60. Yep. And we're using our... Um, J input here. So we need to hook something up to the J. A leaf. Uh, just a simple leaf. So what we're getting here um, is two different rules that are run depending on where we are. So first of all, we've got two is greater than one. Um, which is the very last generation of, sorry, t is equal to 1, is the bottom one, is the very last generation of our leaf, um, of our L system. And what that does is creates uh, a little short, um, like a half length line, and then it sticks a leaf on the end. And there's no uh, rotation on this, so the leaf just sticks directly up on the end of the line. For every other generation, it um, so if that's if t is greater than one, so the first generation is one. Every other generation after that will be greater than one, and it will take um, an f, so it goes forwards, and then it creates two branches, one turning right and one turning left, and our angle here is the degree to which those branches turn. Uh, our step size should determine the size of the leaf and the spacing between them. And because this top leaf only affects the uh, the last generation, then no matter how many generations we have, it will always sit that leaf on top. Uh, so you can see our condition is used to generate the shape of the plant. Uh, one final thing I'm going to look at um, is a angle which you can use to create uh, all sorts of flowers and seeds. Um, it's a something that's completely natural, um, which is uh, described by mathematics, which is a part of the algorithmic beauty of plants. Um, it's a very specific usage, but I think. Um, is worth giving you a demonstration of um, because you can use it for a lot of different things. So once again, let's create a new L system. And this is the formula that we want to put in. So you'll see here it's using our uh, rule with the variable that we change. Um, so copy it in and then explain it to you. It's really straightforward. Uh, the 1 refers to the step size and the 300 is the generations because for each generation we're simply dropping down a point. So let's make our step size 1. Generations 300. And we want to input something. Uh, for the first demonstration, I'll just put in a small sphere. There we go. That's probably not what you're expecting. So what we're doing in uh, this L system is um, we're taking our variable we're 
um, rotating it by 137.5 degrees and this is an absolutely crucial number um, it's uh, known as a Fibonacci number and it's derived from the golden ratio and exactly this value will give you the pattern that you see here if you throw it even just slightly off let's make it point 0.2 you'll see you start getting something different but this number crops up again and again in nature uh, I'm going to use it to make a sunflower and you'll see how it drives the sunflower seed head make our sphere a little bit bigger and you might actually see how that come about so you're starting to get something now that looks like it might be a seed head Uh, then all we're doing is we're moving uh, the F. The F simply moves it forward by a set amount each time. So we're basically rotating it and moving around and dropping down points. Because it's a uh, lowercase f, it's not drawing a line. Let's stick a uppercase f in. Can you see what it's doing? There you go. So you can, now you can see the radial lines that are drawing each point. And... This value here um, is to the power of 0.5, so it's basically the square root of this value. And then we're simply adding one to our number and running it again. Um, this threw me for a while because the uh, upside down cap is normally used for um, rotation, um, but it appears that as long as it's within these brackets, um, the L system and Houdini recognises that as a power sign so it does work so now we're going to tweak this a little bit to make it into a sunflower um, I should say this isn't uh, this formula isn't just used for sunflowers it crops up in lots of different um, things in nature um, and lots of flowers like for example roses and lilies also use this pattern for their petals. Um, there's some examples of them in the documentation. Uh, so in order to make this into a sunflower we need some uh, pieces of files with geometry that represent the pieces of the sunflower. So I'm going to bring in some files that I've already created. Uh, so first of all we have a seed a pretty simple sunflower seed. Second piece is um, if you look at sunflower, you'll see around the edges of the seeds there are some pieces that um, still contain elements of petals and they're more yellow. That makes sense when the sunflower goes together. And then we have a collection of petals. These are all quite similar, it's just to give it some natural variation. remember from when we did the uh, stamping um, because we have only three inputs we're going to have to take our petals and use a switch node uh, and a stamping value to choose between them so let's stick in our switch node and connect up the four petals and then we have our stamping value which should be in here To this is L system 10. So we can hook these up now to our inputs. So already you can see we have our um, first slot of geometry being drawn into our sunflower. 
Um, there's a slight change to the values here. For one thing, we start at zero. Uh, doesn't make a lot of difference because we're adding one each time. Um, it just means that we've got an extra seed in the middle. Uh, the main difference is instead of dropping our j in here, which just takes one piece of input geometry, uh, we use c as a variable and we pass this n value onto c. And then we use a conditional to determine where we draw each input. So in our first line, which is actually our second drill, we take our c n and where the value of n is less than or equal to 440, we add our first piece of geometry, which is j. Uh, so if you um, look at the number of generations here, uh, we only go up to 300. Uh, so we want to go a lot higher than that. Uh, we're going to go up to about 650, I think. So now you'll see there's more seeds being drawn. Now, the go back to our rules. The next uh, value, the next geometry, k, is being drawn between 440, so when n is greater than 440, and when it's less than or equal to 565. And then we get our k, and now you see we get our slightly lighter values around the edge. And then we have our leaves, so we're just running exactly the same thing again, or rather our petals. Um, so you can see this is up to 580, and this will just give us a bit of variation in the petals as we keep going. Uh, at this point we run out of rules on the first page, so we go on to the second page. Sunflower. Uh, that just looks slightly odd with the lines on them. We turn that off. Uh, there's a lot more we could do with this. Uh, at the moment it's pretty flat. We would ideally have it curved around. Um, but this is something you can do with um, L systems as well. We, we would simply be, as we're going up each generation, we'd be moving the position slightly. Um, so that's as much as I'm going to give you now for L systems. If you take a look at the documentation, you'll see there's a few more uh, complicated uh, concepts that you can play around with in the rules. And there are a few more concepts from the algorithmic beauty of plants. Um, ferns is one I'd recommend you look at. Um, they uh, get some really nice results from them. Um, I hope this has been useful. Hopefully this will give you enough to go off and start writing your own L systems. Um, Please uh, subscribe to my channel and uh, if you have anything to ask or uh, just want to leave a comment, please write a comment below and hopefully I'll see you back again for the next video.